Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. My name is Max. And I'm Austin. And today we're going to be doing the action-packed 1978 Shaw Brothers movie, 36 Chambers of Shaolin. Yes, the classic kung fu classic. My favorite <laughs> kung fu movie. This might be Would my you even call movie. it a classic? <laughs> I, I would, in fact, call it a classic, Max. <laughs> um, but, Max, I'm really glad we're doing this movie. Um, we've been wanting to do a kung fu movie for a long time. And uh, the Shaw Brothers, uh, they're, they're great at making them. They made a fucking thousand plus kung fu movies. So <laughs> For every Pokemon, there's a Shaw Brothers movie. I didn't <laughs> know more, if you knew that. Probably <laughs> more. Um, but, yeah, the point is we've been wanting to do a movie from the Shaw Brothers and a kung fu movie for kung fu movie for a long time and i think we couldn't have chosen a better one to start with um probably the closest one we've done so far to a kung fu movie is maybe uh yo jimbo or uh sherlock jr weirdly <laughs> enough what well just like the focus on stunts and the practice you know the the oh. idea of like a pro filmic event occurring with you with buster i'm just keaton. thinking of buster keaton versus bruce lee now <laughs> <laughs> it would be pretty funny that'd be an amazing <laughs> fight Buster Keaton just like haphazardly, uh, unintentionally starting a combat with Bruce Lee. <laughs> I get what you're saying, though, with the yeah. physical acting and that level of planning, choreography, but yeah. still. I mean, it is one of the most interesting things about these movies, and one thing that differentiates them from other martial arts genres. Uh, probably the most closest one that you could compare kung fu movies to is the wuxia genre, which we'll elaborate on in the uh, commentary track. But um, it, it is that emphasis on like the... Um, the pro filmic event, the, the real thing occurring in front of ca the camera. And that's why a lot of these Kung Fu movies from the seventies from the Shaw brothers are so exciting, particularly these movies from Lao Kar Lung and the Kung Fu style that he exhibits in his film, the Hungar style, most commonly. Um, it's just, it's just a very interesting experience to watch because you sit and watch this movie and you're really witnessing something pretty incredible, you know? And it's just a, it's a really like, fun experience to sit back and watch this, you know? So I'm glad we're finally doing it, but I am curious, you know, was there any like impulse that made you want to do a Kung Fu movie this week? Because even though we both kind of agreed to do this one, this was originally your uh, impulse <sighs> here. I, it's very flattering if you Austin that you give me enough credit to think there's any rhyme or reason for why I'm choosing movies at this point. The micro fixations just come to me. I've stopped fighting them. I roll with them and I'm, I've learned to weaponize them against our listeners. Yes. Um, so whenever I have a micro fixation for a couple of weeks now, it, it's going to be your problem. Listeners, yes. not so, mine. So lately you've been what fixating on some sort of subconscious impulse to violence. Is that what this is? Yes, obviously that's <laughs> what I was saying, but no, um, a lot of my micro fixations tend to be repeats of things I previously enjoyed. And yeah. I did, I was involved in a uh, Shaolin Kempo for, better part of a decade so weird to think about i know right use a goth and child now i've settled into this goth dad bud whatever the fuck i have going on so you gotta right go now. back and get the black belt to compete complete your your goth image yeah. the goth kung fu yes because i have to wear my belt wherever i go it's getting very <laughs> awkward wearing only a brown one everywhere but but max you had seen um shaw brothers movies before right yes i yeah. had um I, I loved that growing up i watched a lot of jackie chan films when i was growing up later mm -hmm. moved on to some bruce lee and some Shaw Brothers and just whatever I could get my hand on at my local library, or local video rental store. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there was stuff like when Tro uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon came out. That was like my favorite movie for fucking forever. Yes. Like, and I would even say that's more of a wuxia movie. No, although, it is. But yeah. Like, like we said, they're they're related, you know, and wuxia also very beautiful and elegant and amazing. That movie and Hero, I remember coming out within like 18 Hero, months yeah. of one another. Yeah. Those blew me away as a kid. Um, both those movies are pretty impressive. Um, but, um, yeah, so it, it just been on my mind, and I'm I'm glad we settled on this one. This movie, it, it's just, I know you said it numerous times, but it, it just feels like a classic the second you watch it. It's endearing. It's, in, for the budget it had and for what they're shooting for, it just nails everything. Like, I, I, I'd have... Uh, like no complaints about this movie it's under two hours which is exactly where it needs to be yeah it knows exactly when to begin exactly when to end and just perfect yeah i think it this movie really treats the spectacle of the kung fu in a way that's very exciting you know and that's something that you know if you haven't seen these movies it's a really interesting wrinkle in the kung fu genres how much they focus on training over the actual combat of kung fu um 
and and it treats the mastery and performance of kung fu as its own end more so than like as a means to just get back at people which is an interesting thing we'll explore in the commentary track but it results in something that really celebrates this cultural heritage of this martial arts form you know so uh, the entire history of this martial arts form then informs these movies um, because they actually reproduce it for real in front of the camera and it's just it makes something so exciting and tangible even like 40 years later. You know, I think if you hadn't watched a lot of movies from the 70s, you could sit anyone down to watch this movie and they'll probably find stuff to enjoy just because it's so fun and exhilarating to sit down and watch Gordon Liu go through these hurdles that he has to constantly uh, uh, sort of absorb into his body, these challenges, these these uh, sort of attacks on his body that the monks uh, perform in order to train him. Like, it's just so exciting to witness it. And um, there's just so much to talk about with that. Like, this is probably one of the movies that I'm most excited to jump into that we've uh, done on the show. Um, and yeah, I, I want to save most of it for the commentary track, but uh, if there, unless there's anything else, Max, I think we are ready to set up our podcast as our own 36th chamber, or perhaps a 37th chamber, to give people an entry point into this movie. Here we are, Max, entering the 36th chamber. How many times are we going to make that joke, do you think? Uh, 36, probably. Oh. <laughs> I did find uh, out that, shoot me. The, that classic uh, Shaw Brothers logo was them trying to uh, imitate studios like Warner Brothers. Yes. <laughs> and have a real like Western sense of legitimately yeah, know, yeah, legitimacy yeah. in their film logo, which I found cute. I do really love the uh, Shaw brothers fanfare. And that includes the stuff with like the logo and their insistence on the uh, Shaw scope and all that stuff. And it's like, this is just like classic Hollywood, except it's with Kung Fu movies. I love it. And of course they're, they're classic uh, iconic ending title cards where they're like another Shaw brothers production. It's just so much fun. And you're like, yep, it is another one. Got a thousand more to go. Um, but Max, here we are in the introduction sequence, what I would might maybe call the prologue sequence, because it is an extended credit sequence, right? This is not just the credits happening, but we are really being introduced to the type of like, immediately in microcosm, I think, the sort of ethos of the kung fu film, uh, and specifically Lao Kar Lung's movies uh, in this opening sequence. Um, in some ways, it reminds me of the opening sequence of both La Belle at La Bette and uh, Hammer's Dracula. If you remember Hammer's Dracula, it's completely abstract, much like this one, except it it really hits you over the head with the like stylistic um, supremacy of Dracula, where it's like, yes, this is the first Dracula movie in color. Here's this amazing castle that we have. Here's this bright red hammer blood, right? And it's immediately letting you know that you're in for something different. It's kind of like this as well, where it's very abstract and it's immediately letting you know this is not a movie that's an action movie per se, but it's a movie about the sort of balletic um, and uh, impressive achievements of Gordon Liu's body. That's what it is. It's kind of like a dance movie. It's it's like different set pieces for him to demonstrate his body and his yes. technique. And it's, yeah, the opening credits do a great job of establishing that because none of this has any relevance yeah and also it's not anything that he does later to like train or anything it's just completely abstract you know there's no reason for him to be punching water it's not even particularly impressive it just looks cool yeah especially when you do the slow motion and you're like oh yeah otherwise it just sort of looks like oh, yeah, i'm punching water now okay <laughs> yes that's what you guys want and i mean you can say that it's kind of like a low oh, he's on a star trek set now <laughs> I mean, Max, that's the thing, though, is that the movie so confidently portrays him in this abstract space in this opening sequence where it's like you buy that little level of artifice. Yes. He's on clearly a soundstage, but you're like, this feels real and palpable to me. Why? Because of Gordon Liu, because he's actually doing this kung fu in front of me. And it brings you right back in. That's the sense of reality in these movies that is very interesting and tricky to pin down. And it's something that critics have a really challenging time talking about. Um, the ideas of realism in kung fu movies, because obviously the plot is not realistic. Obviously, there's uh, if you want to talk about levels of artifice, right? They shoot a lot of this stuff on stuff that looks like really elaborate backlots, right? 
and it doesn't make any sort of attempt to really go out into uh, the real world, unlike some of Bruce Lee's movies, which tend to be set in the modern day. Um, these ones, these Hong Kong movies from the Shaw Brothers, are much more focused on a sort of um, late sort of Qing era uh, uh, setting. Um, but uh, the point is that they're blatantly artificial, and they don't really make any effort to try to um, be anything other than like a mythic retelling of this particular era in uh, China's past. Like these movies are self-consciously printing the legend. They are not trying to be naturalistic in any way. But you still have that element of realism that's present in the insistence on like clear demonstration and performance of the Kung Fu. And again, that's something that really differentiates Kung Fu films from Wuxia films as far as martial arts movies go. This guy is the same shit-eating grin. You brought up Yojimbo when we were comparing it to movies. He is the same shit-eating grin as the guy with the pistol in Yojimbo. Oh, is uh, Tatsuya Nakadai? Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, man, what is this guy's name? Wilson Tong, the guy with the great chin. Yes. Uh, he he shows up in a number of other Shaw Brothers, uh, Shaw Brothers movies. If you watch enough of them, you're going to see all their actors pop they had, up they again and again. They had a solid stable of actors, yeah. And you know what? I think all the actors are great. I think the actors are really key to hitting home the tone of these movies, um, which again, we're going to be talking about the contrast of realism and everything. The acting style, not naturalistic at all. No. <laughs> Even for something that you know is coming from a different sort of cultural setting like China, where they have different ideas and standards of acting, even then you can tell it's clearly not aiming for naturalism. And another part of that, and one of my favorite things in these Shaw Brothers movies, are the obviously fake wigs. They just don't give a fuck. But they don't give a fuck, so I don't give a fuck. And exactly. you know what? They're doing real kung fu, so you shouldn't give a fuck either. <laughs> now, Max, one of the really interesting things I sort of keyed in on in this opening sequence uh, that is not related to what we were just talking about with wuxia versus kung fu is the the actual like camera choreography and the aesthetic of this opening sequence. Um, oh, here we have Lole, another Shaw Brothers regular uh, often playing a villain, and he's really great at it because he has those really strong eyebrows. Um, I really love Lole. He's awesome. Um, but this opening sequence here, uh, what is the situation? We have these southern rebels, right? And they're fighting against uh, what are alternatively referred to, depending on what sort of uh, subtitles you have, as the uh, the Manchurians, the Manchus, or the Tartars. Yeah. But essentially, it's the it's the Qing Empire the, dynasty. The, ver the version I had was the Manchus. So yeah, it's interesting seeing it different now. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if there's different uh, versions in terms of dubs and everything. I'm sure there's a bunch of different iterations of it. But point is, it's the Qing dynasty, and you have these southern rebels who are fighting against them. Um, it's not exactly true to life historically. I'm not an expert on Chinese history, and obviously, it's very complicated because it's such a large region of the world, right? Um, but in the sort of mythopoeic imagination uh, and the cultural heritage created by the Kung Fu movies, they really play up this sort of anti-imperialist conflict between the Southern resistance fighters and the more Northern uh, imperial powers of the Qing Empire. And of course, what they were trying to do was restore the Han Chinese dynasty, yes. um, which I believe was the Ming dynasty. But basically, this there are so many. Sorry, I was about to correct you, and then I realized I had the wrong dynasty in my mind. There's so fucking many of them. This is why this movie is yeah. so challenging to prepare for, is because um, it's doing it's doing everything that other movie genres do in addition to what is unique about the actual performance of kung fu on camera. Um, it combines so many things, like what we're talking about right now. It's the same sort of um, sort of nationalist uh, sort of. Uh, nation building uh, mythos building mechanism that is performed by like Westerns, except in this different context for Hong Kong and China respectively. Right. So, but the thing is it's completely different when they're actually performing this very acrobatic uh, Kung Fu style in front of you, especially when you consider that Kung Fu was actually a thing that was used as a weapon against them at the time. And we're going to be talking about that too and how that changes the, its representation here and what that means for the implications of the movie. 
But this opening sequence we have, um, we're basically introduced to someone who, I don't know if he sort of accepts that he's going to be going on a suicide mission, but basically there's a magistrate in the southern town and they're going to be, they're preparing for the arrival of a Qing dynasty sort of general or whatever, right? A very an high value an target. official, yes. Yeah, and uh, these, these resistant fighters are going to go take him out. And the really interesting thing about that opening sequence is how how the aesthetic kind of reminds me of like um, aughts era action movies, stuff like Black Hawk Down. It's weird because the movies and, and the sequence and the way that it establishes the different camera movements, it really s- sort of establishes a vocabulary for shooting and staging a terrorist attack <laughs> where it's alternating between the gl- ground level shots with the crowd and then the person at the top of the roof and they're about to sneak over and, and jump down and attack them. It's a very interesting sort of directorial flourish um, for a movie where a lot of people don't readily associate the virtues of this movie with the actual usage of the camera. Unfairly so, I would say. Well, no, and it does a good job establishing him because we don't know any of these characters or what they're fighting for at the moment. Yeah. Um, it does a good job establishing the guy who's randomly jumping down from a building as somebody we should be rooting for in a very short amount of time. Yeah, and, and not only that, but like in addition to the actual physical fact of um, how, how outnumbered he is, it's sort of, again, in using that vocabulary of what we might associate with like a resistance or terrorist attack, it lets you know that these people are the underdogs. And it's going to be carried over in the sort of very covert nature of their training going forward and and what ends up happening to everyone involved here. Because all these people are going to get wiped out, as we see. Um, but uh, the interesting thing about that, too, is uh, if we're talking about directorial flourish with Lau Kar Lung, it's not something that he's most readily associated with. And I think, again, I think unfairly. And I'm going to point out different moments where I think his directorial skill really shines. Um, most people, when they talk about Lau Kar Lung's virtues as a director, it's usually in reference to the way his career developed, where he started as a kung fu choreography, or a kung fu choreographer. And I think if you watch this movie, the kung fu is beyond reproach, obviously, right? That's never going to be something that people have a problem with with this movie. But people might say that the camera movements, the re- directorial style is not as elaborate or not as um, interesting. And I don't know if I agree with that. And I'm going to compare it to a concept that we talked about in our Buster Keaton uh, Sherlock Jr. episode, uh, where in that in that episode, we sort of established this dichotomy between um, uh, uh, stunt or performance virtu- virtuosity and then camera virtuosity, right? Where it's like, Buster Keaton is really interesting because he does both interestingly or both equally well. He does stuff that's really exciting in terms of like stunt performances, but he's also very clever in how he uses the camera to exhibit those things. And he's not just being lazy with the camera. He's not setting up a stage show. And I think this movie and Lau Kar Lung as well are kind of like unfortunately overlooked when it comes to the actual camera virtuosity. Um, And part of that, too, is just it's easy to maybe not focus on that when the actual kung fu itself, the stunt virtuosity, the performance virtuosity is so impressive in its own right. But we shouldn't overlook his skills as a director. Here we're introduced to Gordon Liu's character taken on uh, Wilson Tong. Sorry, you've pointed out the wigs to me and... (laughs) Now it's just something I'm focusing on. This I mean, entire time. yeah, the, everyone is wearing a fake wig. It's like Lord of the Rings, um, except obvious that they're wearing wigs. But you're telling me Orlando Bloom didn't grow out his hair to eight no, feet long, no. and blonde. I wouldn't be surprised if he did because that was the only reason he was cast. He's like 19, and they were like, "You look like an elf." Can you stand there and look handsome? That's my favorite thing about it. It's like if you look in all the background shots of Lord of the Rings, Orlando Bloom just looks confused because nobody told him what was going on in the shot. They're like, no, 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 don't trouble your stupid little brain. (laughs) You're just there to be handsome. I often feel resentment against Orlando Bloom for the way his career started just for being... I was looking say, like a fucking skinny elf. He has he has been in good stuff. Have you ever seen the director's cut of uh, Kingdom of Heaven? Uh yeah. I he, mean, he it's was whatever. He, he was solid on that. I would say it's not the best movie ever, but it 
it's heads and heels above his other performances and a lot of stuff. But anyway, Max, getting back to this fabulous movie. Um, one of the interesting things about the Kung Fu genre as well that we'll see throughout this entire film is how many overlapping genres it seems to, uh, I don't know, exhibit qualities of. And one of the most interesting ones to me is this idea of the buildings Roman or sort of coming of age story, uh, which a lot of the Shaw brothers movies sort of, uh, revolve around that idea, this idea of coming of age and more specifically the coming of age in terms of Kung Fu performance and Kung Fu mastery, right? There's some sort of inciting event. And then the character has to undergo a training journey in order to master Kung Fu and then defeat their enemy, whatever the, whatever the hell they have to do with it, you know, but the Kung Fu mastery is always something that kind of coincides with a uh, character arc in as much as there are character arcs in these movies. Um, and it's just very interesting to me that it's, it's treated as like this passage of maturity because he's starting off, you know, we're making fun of his wig, Gordon Liu. He's very uh, wet behind the ears. He's a student, right? Um, or it could just be from all the glue holding the wig to his head. <laughs> Yes, he's not literally wet by the ears. Um, but it's interesting how he spends the majority of this movie as a student, and then the destination for him is becoming the master, right? Becoming a teacher. That's the true arc of this movie, is going from someone who is learning mastery to someone who is teaching it. I do love this. Like, it, it is corny, but like, Although we don't get a lot of time with him and his two student friends, like their expressions and body movements you can get that were just like, oh, we're so fucking cool. We're delivering secret messages for the rebel group. We're, we're fucking awesome, man. It yeah. Feel, it feels genuine. Well, it's a specific acting style too, which is again, not, not a naturalistic acting style, but I think it's deliberate that they're not going for that. And again, uh, Kung Fu is something that's inherently associated with uh, a certain type of theatricality. Um, because of the way that it was practiced historically. Um, so part of me wonders, too, whether a lot of the acting decisions in these kung fu movies are actually... It's not simply an instance of, like, overly telegraphed or histrionic acting. It is actually an inherited style that they are working with from the history of kung fu. Um, but the point in bringing up the stuff with the buildings, Roman, and some of these overlapping genres is going to help differentiate... <laughs> what? What's so funny to you? I love that. Just open up the box and instead he just fucking smashes it in half. Well, yeah. And that's, that's the inciting in. Like, that's how we know that you can be taught Shaolin techniques. Is this guy just being extra and karate chopping a box open? And the movie emphasizes it by uh, shooting it in slow motion. Yeah. Yeah. From a crate that's presumably built to be opened, you know, because it contains merchandise to be sold. Right. Again, it seems kind of silly, but we're going to talk more about why this is, you know, the certain heritage of Kung Fu storytelling, because there's a certain reason you would do that, Max. And uh, it has certain political implications, actually quite exciting and interesting. But um, to get back to what I was saying about comparing this to the wuxia genre, I think emphasizing the elements of the story that talk about this journey of mastery and, um, and growth are really what differentiate it from the wuxia, where I feel like in in the wuxia genre, characters are much more stagnant uh, in terms of they've already achieved mastery, and it's a little bit more elegiac. And um, right now I'm just going to quote from a really great book called Chinese Martial Arts Cinema, The Wuxia Tradition by Stephen Tao. And he talks a lot, this is about wuxia specifically, but he goes to great pains to uh, differentiate it from kung fu movies. And he writes in the, in the introduction, um, uh, that thus the emphasis of the Kung Fu film is on the martial arts while the emphasis of the Wuxia film is on chivalry and the pursuit of righteousness. The hero in Kung Fu films can and often does display the same dedication to chivalry and the pursuit of righteousness as the sword-wielding knight errant, though their fighting traditions hail from different schools, namely Wudang and Shaolin. Uh, 
And uh, on the next page, he continues, the Kung Fu film's emphasis is on the training and technique of martial arts. Thus, the fighting styles, primarily fist fighting, but also leg kicking and even head butting, differ from those of Wuxia, uh, though the heroes of both espouse Sha, or knight, knightly, principles. Um, so again, they're, they're related, and they both feature sort of heroic knight er- cap, uh, characters who are playing around in this sort of mythopoeic cultural heritage of the Chinese past, the pre-modern Chinese past, um, but with a slightly different emphasis. The Kung Fu movie is much more focused on the mastery of these skills and then their pragmatic application. Whereas, you know, you watch a Wuxia movie and they are beautiful and very elegant and interesting, but it's like a lot of wire work. It's a lot of obvious special effects. You watch a Wuxia movie and you're like, I know people cannot literally fly around through the sky. Yeah. It's not possible, unless you're Neil Breen. What are you talking about? Neil Breen does all his own stunts. <laughs> yeah. It's entirely real. This is like when he hired a real tiger to be in, in his movies. <laughs> yes. Wuxia movies, as well, have a little bit of a different impulse in terms of how you uh, relate them to the national character of mainland China. Um, Wuxia movies and their fighting styles are more commonly associated with the Northern Peking opera. Um, whereas Kung Fu is also very closely associated with opera performance. But, uh, again, there's a little bit of a regional, regional differentiation there. Um, the Northern Wuxia style, the stories often also revolve a lot more around the ideas of nation building explicitly. Um, we've already brought up the movie Hero, the great Zhang Yimou movie, yes. once on the show. But if you remember the story from that movie, it is about, you know, this one this one uh, sort of king, this one um, monarch trying to unite China under one banner, right? And it's kind of this elegiac, tragic, um, beautiful story about these characters and their different impulses struggling to actually, you know, hold this giant area together actually as one community right? Whereas this movie and a lot of other Kung Fu movies are explicitly taking the opposite sort of, uh, I don't know, political approach where they're about resistance to, uh, some outside imperialist force that's trying to like homogenize their culture or whatever. It's not really that subtle in these movies. Mostly they're just cackling bad guys, (laughs) but it is a noticeable difference when you actually watch the movies Uh, and compare them with wuxia films. And that's, you know, a lot of critics have been tempted to talk about these movies and their sort of uh, different nationalist impulses uh, and compare the sort of nationalist impulses of Hong Kong-centered kung fu movies with those of the mainland wuxia movies, but I think it's it's a little bit more complicated than that. I think wuxia is a little bit more simple because it is more just evenly associated with the nation of China and there's less ambiguity there, was Hong Kong didn't exist 200 years ago, you know? It was not like its own space. Yeah. It is more an invention of colonialism than China is, right? And if we really think about it, a lot of these movies are being made in this really ambiguous space where Hong Kong is still under control of the British. Right? Because that didn't end until, what, 1997 or a rigi- so? A ridiculously long time. Yeah. So the idea of nation and nationality in the subtext of these Hong Kong Kung Fu movies is a little bit more complicated and a little bit more ambiguous, where you have a lot of elements that can be read as anti-colonialist, but there are a lot of people who point to them as being somewhat anti-Maoist as well. Because remember, one of the things about Hong Kong when it industrializes over the last 100 years is that it immediately becomes this, uh, this haven of like extremely laissez-faire capitalism right the freest of free markets yes for better or for worse and i think that is something that works its way into the the specific culture that has been built in hong kong and the sort of uh, mindset and attitudes of the people who live there And I think that's part of why, too, a lot of the kung fu storytelling in cinema uh, revolves around one folklore character, Wang Fei Hung. And he's a southern, associated with the South at least, 
Um, Wang Feihang was this really famous sort of folklore character. And again, it's one of those instances of sort of printing the legend where in all of his movies, he's doing these fantastic, amazing adventures and his life really wasn't quite <laughs> like that. He was just really talented at Kung Fu, but he was also kind of known as like a type of healer and, and spiritualist in other ways. Um, but again, it's just another way that like Hong Kong is kind of building its own national identity in different ways in a more local way than the Wuxia film through these Kung Fu films. And because of that weird ambiguity caused by like the colonialism clashing with also like, uh, like its relationship with China, uh, these movies are inherently kind of like transnational as well. They're not as culturally specific in some ways as Wuxia films. It's... <sighs> Chinese film, especially mainland Chinese film, is a completely different animal. We'll have to tackle a different day just because, like, contemporary main, mainland Chinese film is becoming increasingly relevant, and it's just a completely different language than westernized film. It, it's going to be a very interesting deep dive when we do eventually get there. Yeah, the cultural specificity is evident to you, whereas you watch this and you understand there's certain elements of cultural specificity, but it doesn't, like feel like a mode of address that is completely alien to you, you know? And I think that's why a lot of these Kung Fu movies became very popular. And I think that's why, you know, the Kung Fu boom, even though the Shaw brothers started making movies before Bruce Lee, it really begins with Bruce Lee. Um, he's the one who inaugurated like the global popularity of Kung Fu with his movies at the start of the seventies. Um, but Bruce Lee also is the perfect avatar of these Hong Kong Kung Fu movies because he himself is such a transnational person with his history. You know, he's born in America, but he's raised in Hong Kong, right? And he studies in Hong Kong. And then he goes back to America and he's sort of like this nation hopping, uh, charismatic actor, right? So he embodies a lot of that transnationalism. And it makes complete sense to me that, you know, kung fu movies would end up being much more popular than wuxia movies because of that. Like, I don't know if you've seen any, um, like, classic wuxia movies, like uh, stuff from King Hu. When when I was much, much younger. But I, yeah. The movies are really amazing. Stuff like Come Drink With Me or, uh, you know, uh, uh, Touch of Zen is probably his most famous one or Dragon Inn. But he... He makes there's a lot of similarities to these kung fu movies, but the stylistic approach really does a lot to separate it, and um, you can clearly tell why they're not as popular. That being said, I would blanket recommend those to pretty much anyone, especially if you like these movies. It's an interesting contrast. You were trying to think of the porn name for this before, and we couldn't do it, but I, I have to say, "Come Drink with Me" has a much easier porn name. Yes. Maybe we should explain the background of that, where I was thinking like it would be really fun to do some sort of porn parody of the 36th Chamber of Shaolin, where you have like just two pilgrim whores making their way to the temple to learn all the 36 chambers of fucking or whatever. So listeners, if you have a good if you have a good name for whatever that movie would be, you can get back to us. Give, give us your 36 Chambers of Shaolin porn parody titles below. Yes, and then we'll make it happen for real. Yes. That being said, though, Max, I don't know if you know this, but actually, once the Shaw Brothers studio collapsed in the 80s, uh, some of the actors in this movie, including Gordon Liu, did go into what was called kink fu, which was kung fu porn parodies. I don't know if you know about this. Gordon Liu actually went on to go make a movie alongside his, his Kill Bill co-star, David Carradine, about um, the flying guillotine. It, which was a, this really horrifying device that asphyxiated the person who was using it. I knew you were going to be doing fucking <laughs> bullshit. I was just waiting for it. I was like, this is way too intricate of a story. Austin's <laughs> bullshit me right now. It's a dedication to the stupid-ass David <laughs> Carradine jokes. The second you said Kill Bill, I'm like, oh, I know where this is going. Oh, uh, yeah. But, uh, of course, we should mention Gordon Liu wasn't Kill Bill. Not just the man with the iron fists. Oh, man, with the Iron Fists. Yeah, I didn't... I don't know how much I brought that up during the intro, but uh, the whole Shaw Brothers phenomenon is responsible for uh, one of my favorite contemporary So Bad It's Good movies, The Man with the Iron Fists, directed by the one, the only, the RZA. Yes. Um, is, I'm sure most people... 
there has to be a good portion of listeners who would search this episode on iTunes or whatever, who would have an interest in it specifically because of the Wu Tang Clan, right? Yeah, the, the Shaw Brothers catalog had a huge influence on them, especially. I mean, their first album. Was I mean, called that's an understatement. Chambers, yeah, to say that it had a huge influence, it's like it is the influence. Yes. Like everything about the Wu Tang, I'm not an expert on the Wu Tang Clan, but it seems like literally everything about their lives they took from these kung fu movies. And honestly, do you want to talk about that? Because I have to say that's one of the more interesting, like instances of a movie forming a specific type of like cult following. Like yeah. I'm trying to think of other movies that like, had that specific connection. I was you know? watching uh, interviews with the RZA actually. Some oh, of it's so much fun to yeah. listen to him talk about this stuff. He, you can tell he's super fucking passionate. He's about such it. a fucking nerd. He, it's, it's so he delightful. He loves it. He really does, and it's yeah. genuinely fun to watch him talk about it. Um, I believe you can also find a commentary track on this movie that features him online. <laughs> Google that, listeners. It's pretty cool. Look, go listen to that instead of our fucking one. Um, yeah, he's incredibly knowledgeable about all these. He's seen all of them. He is. I, I'm, yeah. I, if any, I would believe that anybody has seen every Shaw Brothers movie. It would be the RZA. He knows more about them probably than any of the people that worked on them. Um, he now, but I, I believe some of the interviews I found were for like behind the scenes stuff for Man with the Iron Fist. Yeah. Um, and just sort of Wu Tang Clan retrospectives. But he was talking about how he's growing up in like shitty parts of New York and these would be these movies would be playing like next to like in porno theaters basically um, yeah on um, these these movies i mean we watch them now and it does kind of look like they have this really studio s- system style like high production value sets and costumes and these really great performances but when they were shipped abroad even though they were popular they were still playing in kind of like exploitation type theaters yes they were popular within that restriction i suppose you know he was talking about how like a lot of them were R rated, so like they'd pay like the local crackhead to like buy them a <laughs> ticket to get in. Like it's it's fucking crazy. But um he always talked about how like whenever a Shaw Brothers movie made it to the screen, it was like a special treat for them because they knew it was gonna be a mark above in quality. Yeah. My favorite quote that I found from him in regards to that is This is like, such a weird quote. It is. It's so incredibly specific and bizarre, but it's just like oh, the difference between a regular martial arts movie and a Shaw Brothers movie. It's like difference between corn flakes and frosted flakes. And I guess it's weird to me because I expect it's just an I wouldn't my mind wouldn't go to cereal. And also a cereal that's like only marginally better than the cereal <laughs> because before. it has sugar on it. Yeah. Um, where I would say this movie is fundamentally different than other Kung Fu movies. A lot of it relating to the prowess of Lao Kar Lung. But that, that silly quote aside, he did go on to talk about how uh growing up as a black youth in america he it was sort of just like this interesting thing of just like watching a struggle of adversity like in the face of adversity that like wasn't theirs at all it yes was somebody completely else somebody on the other side of the world but it still spoke to them but at the same time being an escape from their everyday life simultaneously something that is a fantastic sort of adventure story but is rooted in, again, this heritage of resistance that we're, that we've talked about already with these yeah. Kung Fu movies, this resistance against this imperialism from the North. So no, I, as soon as he said that and started going on about like, <laughs> and also it seems a lot like, um, the Shaw brothers movies and the Kung Fu movies were like, a lot of fans of those might have been the original weebs in a way. Of just <laughs> when he was talking about how like they would go out and practice all the special moves on oh, each other. Oh man, thank God they didn't get into fucking anime. That would have ruined them. The Naruto clan. Oh Jesus. <laughs> but Max, I, I do think the Wu-Tang clan specifically is really fascinating. And I think that idea of the like the sort of um African American attraction to these types of movies, that is a thing, right? over the last like however many years or whatever, like that is a thing where it did have this connection to that audience specifically yes. in the U S right. Um, I think there is something really interesting about that. And I think the Wu-Tang clan is this fascinating example of how this movie operates. as like a cult movie too, because something that we'll talk about is how this movie sort of becomes its own, like 
it becomes like a metaphor for its own 36 chamber where the movie becomes a 36 chamber for exhibiting Kung Fu techniques to its audience. And in that way, it's a very welcoming um, sort of didactic movie to its audience where it's like, yes, you're going to enter this film and we're going to exhibit these ancient forms of Kung Fu for you and how they are mastered. And um, because of that, it is kind of politicizing and inviting its audience to resistance in interesting ways. And, part of me wonders like that's a really interesting way to like speak to an audience on the other side of the world because it's this very accessible and fun uh, way to actually engage with them on a political level, whether they realize it or not, because it's inviting you into this experience and sort of, again, um, inspiring in you this Kung Fu ethic, so to speak. And part of me wonders whether or not that, has to that has something to do with its transnational appeal because these movies were so popular abroad. And you have to ask yourself, I mean, the Wu-Tang Clan, they took a lot of it inspiration and then they sort of transmuted Kung Fu into a different art form, that yes. of music. Well, they're called the Wu-Tang Clan because a different Shaw brother, yeah, Shaw Brothers movie. Right. There's uh, some there's so many Shaolin things. versus Wu Tang or Wu Dang or something like that. Yeah, the Easter eggs are infinite yes, with the Wu Tang Clan. But the uh yeah, because Wu Tang style was undefeatable in that one, and their rhymes are undefeatable. Which yeah, is, which is why they named themselves that. Their first album is called Thirty Six Chambers, though. Like, yeah, it's, it's a direct connection. But the idea is that they transmute like kung fu form into music. Yeah, but you also have to wonder how many people were inspired by these movies more literally to just pick up kung fu. Yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, it wasn't these movies in particular, but definitely kung fu movies in general i was just like that's cool as shit yeah and i think the interesting thing about this one is that it is so it's like the epitome of that type of storytelling where it's like we have now passed the first act and now he's in the temple and this is the highlight of the movie because this is what it's all about this is the training this is the learning this is the this is the journey to mastery and because of the way these movies work and the way kung fu works historically uh kung fu has built into it a type of theatricality that is that is designed to like attract people to it and um and uh sort of i don't know guarantee its its own survival um another essay i'm going to quote from right now actually is uh an essay called martial arts north and south lu jia lang's vision of hungar in shaw brothers films by gina marchetti and Lu Jia Lang is Lao Kar Lung, except Lu Jia Lang is in Mandarin, Lao Kar Lung in Cantonese. Another really fucking confusing part of doing research for this movie. But uh, Gina Marchetti has some really interesting thoughts on the way that, uh, and insights into the way that Kung Fu was performed historically. And I'm just going to read straight from the essay here when she writes, Since the times of its founder, Hong Shi Guan, the titular hero of Hong Shi Guan, a.k.a. Executioners from Shaolin, which is another Shaw Brothers movie, um, until the end of the Manchu rule, the system has depended for its survival on a balancing act between active recruitment of new members and hiding from Qing authorities, dedicated to overthrowing the non-Han Qing dynasty and re restoring the Ming dynasty, Hungar traces its history back to the same point in time as do the triads and a number of other secret societies dedicated to an anti-Manchu and often illegal uh, other activities. The Hungar practitioners intermingled with opera troops traveling around southern China on what were known as red boats, Chinese junks plying the Pearl River Delta area used by itinerant acting companies. Since the Chinese opera repertoire includes stories based on military exploits covering martial arts skill with theatrical bravura, allowed for the system to spread. Theoretically, training an army to combat Manchu rule while allowing rebels to eke out an existence, an eke out an existence, uh, or I'm sorry, eke out a marginal livelihood on stage. On the next page, he continues, even after the system became more settled in Guangdong, far from the imperial court, Hungar retained many of its theatrical elements, including a reputation for dramatic line dancing, a staple of folk ritual used to celebrate the Lunar New Year, uh, bless new enterprises, and keep martial arts students in top shape without engaging in actual combat. In addition to one-person shadowboxing forms, Hungar is also known for elaborate two-person sets. These sets, similar to their less bellicose opera cousins, allow for the basic elements of the system to be displayed publicly to entice new recruits while still veiling the martial and implicitly rebellious nature of the art from the authorities. 
Uh, and she finishes up by writing, Visible but occult, open but very difficult to master, traditional but revolutionary. Hungar spread as both a martial arts system and as a popular representation of the contradictions rocking China. And I think that's a very great summation of why Kung Fu is simultaneously a performative act and the actual act of rebellion itself. And that sort of ambiguity that originally people who are resisting the Qing government uh, would practice by treating Kung Fu as a form of entertainment in addition to using that as a way to politicize people and bring them into their acts of resistance is probably at the core of why this movie retains some of that and why it is so easily uh, brought to film. Because when we're showing actual Kung Fu stuff here, you can make, you can nitpick and say like they have different edits in different areas and it's not real Kung Fu because real Kung Fu, you wouldn't be fighting someone for 10 plus minutes. You would fight them for 30 seconds and hopefully win. Um, you can nitpick that, right? But that's not the point. The point is the theatricality, and it is just as historically relevant and accurate as literal, real, useful kung fu. Not the force, though. Uh, what we just witnessed was Gordon Liu going into the top chamber because he wanted to start started the hardest thing, and then a monk just force pushes him across the hallway. Yeah. Ah, 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 ah. He's such a master; he can just like bend air or whatever. He's an airbender, I guess. Don't sound so enthusiastic about that. Jeez. <laughs> I don't know, just fucking airbender. But Max, that was one of the most exciting things I learned about, about Kung Fu while doing the research is how this act, it's, it's this weird thing where like doing Kung Fu is in these movies and throughout history, you have practitioners of Kung Fu, actual like revolutionaries performing an idea of Kung Fu that is Kung Fu. You know what I mean? In front of other people, and they're using that as an actual thing to spread a sense of culture and um, community that they can use to aid their, uh, I don't know, dissenting activities. So again, just to return all of this to the appeal of the Wu-Tang Clan. Um, <laughs> of course. The interesting thing about the Wu-Tang Clan and this movie is that this movie is in carrying through that Kung Fu tradition really actively and deliberately saying, hey, isn't Kung Fu awesome? In the same way as those revolutionaries, it is. it has built into it this need to inspire people and welcome them, in, them into the tradition of Kung Fu and resistance. So the Wu-Tang Clan forming in reference to these movies is also exactly the mission of these movies, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And think about it, Max. Think about how many people... The chain continues infinitely, right? Because the Wu-Tang Clan, in adapting the same ethic, think about how many people they fucking inspired to take up Kung Fu. Yeah. So it's The, move, the movie works. It yeah. truly is the 36th chamber in itself. And it's evidence in the way that it engage with, engages with its audience all over the world. And it is a really beautiful thing. I, did, I probably should have mentioned this in the introduction, but like... Watching this movie, I was really struck by the sense of sincerity and love that it had for me as an audience member. Like you can tell that this is they're they're exhibiting this, you know, historically important thing to their region and their culture. And they just have master practitioners um really sincerely trying to capture this essence of kung fu and this work ethic, you know? And it begins with this opening trial. Max, what do you think of the first chamber that we get to witness? It lasts a bit longer than the rest of them, just because yes. we're sort of establishing like the whole every chamber has its own gimmick. The but pattern. I, I I do love it. Um I am curious if they would just let him die if he kept failing. <laughs> oh god, I made you spit everywhere with that. <laughs> <laughs> they would let him drown, you mean? <laughs> I was just gonna say let him starve. They went to all the effort. <laughs> See, with the, all the effort to save him from, like, his busted leg. I was like, no, you can't hop over a log, man. Sorry. So for anyone not watching this with us, we should explain. The first chamber is this very basic test, and it's to get to the cafeteria. The cafeteria is the 35th chamber. And basically, the idea is that you have to jump across this pit of water, across these logs that are bundled together, um, these buoyant sort of bamboo bundles right and you have to walk across them without sinking in order to get to the cafeteria so you can actually eat your food and if you can't do that you can't eat 
and you need your clothes to be dry and presentable in order to eat. So you can't go in with wet clothes. So it forces them to learn how to uh, adopt a level of like balance and self-control over their body in order to actually have access to food. And you're right, Max. I think they do spend a little bit longer on this chamber because they need to establish the pattern they're going for. But also they're establishing this really interesting idea in the Kung Fu training that I really love um, and, and the novelty of the training. Uh, and something that I feel like after this movie, almost every Kung Fu movie about training would try to uh, riff on in some way where the training activities are not related to the actual act of Kung Fu at all. Yes, I think some movies do that better than others. Um, I mean, like you have fucking Karate Kid class. That's probably the most famous one. Yeah, wax on, wax off. Yeah. But, but of course, it it's all rooted in this movie. Yeah. Where they're just trying to get food. But we're going to see later that all these different chambers we see have an important uh, application. And it's really lovely at the end of the movie um, to see how Lau Kar Lung choreographs all the action and you see him actually go through and use an element from every skill that he picked up along the way. You see him do certain things with his wrists. You see him, you know, use uh, skills that he learned um, while holding the two barrels of water out. You know, it's really great to see them pay that off in the actual choreography. And because Gordon Liu is amazing, of course, he can pull it off seamlessly. And just as a side note, I do think that's a fun part of Gordon Liu's performance that um, kind of gets overrated is how good he is at pretending to be bad at Kung Fu. Yeah. <laughs> Wall is low. Power of Buddha is high. That's a great line. Yeah, what just happened was Gordon Liu tried to cheat the system by jumping over the wall where he wouldn't have to uh, jump across the logs. And then the monk came out of nowhere and smacked his ass into the water. Uh, it's so Literally great. out of nowhere. He was just <laughs> yes. hiding under the wall waiting for somebody to pull that shit. Now, Max, the other interesting thing, if we want to treat the, the sequences of this movie and the idea of Kung Fu in its theatrical form and uh, exhibition as a type of like veiled political act to recruit and exhibit Kung Fu for people. Um, I think it's interesting to look at this movie's ethic as being ambiguously Marxist as well. And I'm going to tell you why. Because, okay, there's different ways of reading this. And some people have also read this as being a more capitalist ethic as well, which I understand and I think it's debatable. But in terms of how I'm choosing to do so, I'm going to choose to read it in a Marxist way. Of course we are. Welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. Here's the thing. When he's doing all these activities in these chambers that are not related to Kung Fu at all, instead it is tied to an essence of materialism. And it's, it's specifically tying the nature of his future political resistance to the Manchus and his ability to strike back at them and liberate his community to the material conditions in front of him. And I find that to be an inherently Marxist idea, the idea of your specific form of resistance tied to your material conditions. And here he does the amazing thing where he jumps over the logs with one foot. Hey, yeah, hey, we all love you now. Yes, now he's no longer Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. <laughs> Everyone loves him. Your failure is now exploitable. But Max, what do you think of that idea of like this Marxist element in, in all of this stuff, right? Because if you're looking at all the different ways they train, and this is something we see in the third act, it's a lot of it is related to elements of manual labor. And in some ways it's like, oh man, the training and, and the way that they are used to build towards a ethic of Kung Fu, it's kind of like creating a revolutionary subjectivity through the contradictions and systems that these people are already stuck in. You know? I get that. I mean, I, I see what you mean of just, like, it can be read as both, like, a communist and a capitalist ethic. Yeah. Because, like, oh, you're just pulling, you have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. That's and, the flip side of it. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's worth elaborating on that, too. When we talk about the potential capitalist reading of this stuff, a lot of this stuff is manual industrial labor. And the 36 chambers do kind of, Establish this semi-linear 
um, straightforward sense of progress through hard work that I associate kind of with like the, the good old American capitalist Protestant work ethic, you know, or it's like your success materially is based on your good works, you know? Um, so if you work hard, you'll get what's coming to you. Of course, that's not the case. No. Capitalism is built on exploitation. And the fact that we see there's 80 bajillion other people yes. around him also trying to learn and they don't become instant kung fu god. And again, the fact of becoming a kung fu god, also you could potentially read as serving more that capitalist ethic because you know a lot of these kung fu movies, they are based on the performative mastery of the leading characters, right? The reason why Gordon Liu is the lead of this movie is because he's amazing at Kung Fu individually. You can't just get anyone to do that. And these movies are going to highlight him as an individual so much that it these movies in their storylines become really quite different from, uh, in terms of resisting the, the Qing Empire, it's often led to like the activities of one outstanding individual to resist them. Well, from what I understand from my research... Um a lot of the earlier Shaw Brothers Kung Fu movies were more of like team affairs yes. more than anything. It was just like a bunch of students and one master or just like a cast of different characters. But um, because of stars like Bruce Lee and whatnot, they had to sort of reevaluate the shape of their movies and yes. try to make them more stars. Focused. Bruce Lee definitely is a stronger example of that capitalist um, sort of individual conquering the antagonisms of the system. And, and destroying them and reconciling everything. Um, we always talk about that being sort of like a an ideological trap or lie that's inherent in a lot of movies that embrace a capitalist ideology, you know? Whereas if you look at a lot of the older Soviet films and sort of Soviet storytelling, um, one of the things they do in their stories to sort of emphasize a more Marxist solution to systemic problems is like the collective uprising. And it has to be a collective solution. Right. This movie kind of walks the line between the two of them and it remains ambiguous where, you know, he becomes the outstanding godlike individual who is able to reconcile the contradictions in the political system. However, Max, it's not enough for him to simply beat the people who destroyed his family. He has to establish the 36 chamber and build the community, you know? Yeah. So it, it, it ambiguous, it ambiguously walks the line between the two of them. Well, it does never lose sight, even when the movie is at its most uh, Mary Sue, I guess, of just like, wow, you're better at this than anybody we've ever taught before. He never loses sight of his goal, which is to make it accessible to everybody. Yeah. And it, it's interesting that the fact of him trying to make it accessible to everyone and ha have that sort of pragmatic real world application, it's praxis. <laughs> Right. Um, if we're going to go with basically applying a meme at this point, it's praxis. Um, but the interesting thing about it, too, he's reading the literature, so you don't have to. <laughs> I mean, you could definitely read the Shaolin's kind of as a type of like negligent vanguard class that he then repoliticizes by reattaching their connection to the real world. Yeah. You know, Um. oh, man, this shit, this shit looks so impressive, by the way. Also, a little fun fact here. If you're watching this with us, you're going to notice that Gordon Liu has a noticeable sunburn in <laughs> some of these shots. Oh, yeah. So you're like, oh, man, how many days were they filming this water shit? Well, that guy behind him has a worse sunburn, too. Look at his fucking legs. And I know Gordon Liu is strong and a master of kung fu in this movie, even at the tender age of 23. But holy fuck, this still could not have been easy for him. I know he's pretending to be, like, exhausted, but... That's got to be like 40 pounds of water in yeah. each hand. You got your fucking knives. How many people do you think die a day doing this? Now or just in this movie? Just in this movie. I don't know. I don't know if they would let you die. Dying seems too easy. I really like the master of this chamber, the second chamber they're in. Should we describe what's going on right now, by the oh, way? Oh, yeah. So for those of us who are not watching... um. Right now, in the 34th chamber of Shaolin, they... Next chamber up. Yes, they have to keep this endless cycle going of filling up yeah, buckets with water, 
climbing up a pyramid with knives under their arms so they can't let the buckets hang by their waist. They have to have their arms extended all the way out, otherwise they stab their ribs. Yes, and then climb up a pyramid um, and dump it down so that it will go back into the uh, the well and you can recreate the process ad nauseum. Yes, and this is how they do their laundry as well. Yes. So the first chamber, it was the cafeteria. This one, it's the laundry. I really like the master of this one because the master of this one also kind of embodies that ambiguity. Yes, of the which becomes foundational later on. Yeah, that's the really great thing about this movie too is that it views the kung fu like something we need to really establish right now before we get any further into this is that when we talk about kung fu, we're not just talking about the actual martial arts. Martial arts is a specific part of kung fu, but if you're not as familiar with it, you're going to overlook the fact that kung fu itself refers most specifically to like the idea of work ethic itself, to the idea of building a type of mastery over a specific thing. It doesn't have to be martial arts, you know? Kung Fu is reaching a level of proficiency and like self-control and um, building the self up. You know what I mean? So it has this inherent attachment to things that are not necessarily martial arts. And a lot of the chambers here, again, that not only do they have nothing to do with martial arts, they're literally related to material things that people just do normally. So they are building martial arts skills out of normal everyday quotidian activities. Getting, again, getting back to that materialism. But to finish the point I was going to make about uh, that second chamber master in the way that he ambiguously smiles and then scolds Gordon Liu for helping other people up the pyramid is that he really embodies that, um, that ambiguity that defines their training, where it's like, okay, you can't help people because you're going to make their training easier for them and you're going to deprive them of the challenge and struggle that is necessary to build the self up. But at the same time, the instinct to help other people is the enlightened instinct, right? So you have this really interesting moment where that master of that chamber tells Gordon Liu to get the fuck out of here, and Gordon Liu thinks it's because he just got scolded for helping someone, and he's like, no, get the fuck out of here because you're going to the next chamber. Yay. It's kind of like a game show thing where he's like, you're going to have to leave because you're going on to the next round. But here we are in the third chamber, Max. This seems like it would be a fucking nightmare. To be fair, most of these seem like they'd be a fucking nightmare. <laughs> yes. the, the specific way they train in this one is so relatable and interesting. So what this chamber is, is Gordon Liu is picking up a 10... Question, 10 a 12 pound? foot. Or it's a 10 foot weight. 10 pound on, weight? 10 pound weight on a 12 foot pole of bamboo. And to be fair, some of these poles of bamboo, they say it's like 15 feet or whatever... Um, at a certain point, Gordon Liu is holding them and he's clearly further than 15 feet away. <laughs> um, but it's a, yeah, it's a 10 pound weight on a stick of bamboo. Oh, see the, imp the impression that I got, cause in the beginning, the guy says, Oh, put on another two feet. I, I, I was under the impression that like you, you hold it at the length that you physically can when you first start and then oh, you, yeah. you go longer, the stronger you get. Oh yeah. These poles are very long. Yeah. But the idea is that you have these monks who are kind of like scribes who are reading something and they have this bell in the middle of this courtyard. And every time they hit this wooden block, Gordon Liu has to, holding the end of this pole that is at the opposite end of the weight, has to use the weight as a gong to hit the bell. And it, they say it, with the 12th thing, it weighs about 120 pounds because you're trying to fight against the gravity. Yeah, whatever of the, multiplication, whatever yeah. math you can do to to sort of guess at how much it would feel like it weighs at that point. Um, but if you can imagine it, it is hell on the wrists. So they have all these, ma this makeup of their like bruised wrists. Yeah. Um, and this one's maybe the most interesting method of training so far, because it's one of those parts of your body that you wouldn't necessarily expect Kung Fu to really arduously focus on and train. But of course the wrist would be important, wouldn't it? Yeah. And Gordon Liu has to ring the bell every time they hit the wooden block. And something that's interesting about this chamber, especially, is how like it, it hits that element of like the relatable pain. That's yeah. always interesting. Where you can see something in a movie and then you like feel a very it important your... thing in horror movies, which is why like the super elaborate deaths in horror movies are never really like the worst. But it's just like 
a specific when somebody's like bone is coming out of their leg or something. You know what one I always think of with horror movies is from The Prowler when there's the girl swimming in the pool and then she's climbing out with a ladder and then it goes to a POV shot and the Prowler stalker character kicks her in the nose. Yeah. And it's like, oh my God. You can feel that. Yeah, like I feel it in my own nose because I've been hit in the nose. I've never had my like stomach stabbed, but I have been kicked in the nose or whatever before, so... But it's interesting you mentioned that, too, because I think uh, it's yet another way that the theatricality of kung fu, like, sort of subconsciously recruits its audience to this kung fu training and ethic where it's like you watch these movies and you feel certain moments in your body. These movies are kind of participating in what some people will call body genres, where they have this affective property on your body. Horror is one of them. Uh, other genres like this would be, like, cooking tv shows you see a cooking tv show and just as quickly as you like cognitively understand what's happening your tongue will start watering yeah so it's affecting your body and your sort of sensuous uh different senses in addition to your mind right horror obviously probably the most the biggest example of that porn another example the 36 chambers of the great british bake-off <laughs> yes 36 chambers of cake that would be great if it was just one giant cake, like a Tower of Babel. Person had to climb up at the top to get married. Here we have a classic Shaw Brothers uh, element here with the catch lights in this monk's eye. This is probably my favorite chamber. The eyeball training, where he has to follow the uh, shiny pendulum with his eyes without moving his head. Sorry, I forgot because the swastika. Yes, you see swastikas in this movie. <laughs> the swastika is an ancient Buddhist symbol that the Nazis ruined for everybody. I just I had an experience at a bar recently where uh, I went outside to the deck to smoke a cigarette, and this guy's like in the middle of a conversation about how the swastika is actually a Buddhist symbol. No, but he's like he's pulling down his shirt. He's just like, well, I have this tattoo, and originally <gasps> it's a Buddhist symbol. It no, was, it wasn't a swastika. But I like started laughing. He's like, "What's up, man?" I'm just like, "I I legitimately thought you were gonna like pull down your shirt." What the an... fuck was it though? It was just like a, I don't even know if it was actually Buddhist. It looked like a kitschy little like Western spirituality type thing. You gotta wonder every time someone gets a tattoo like that. It's like, well, I know you're an idiot. Just, I just know, right? And then you have to wonder. It's like someone getting a like <laughs> like kanji tattoos or whatever yeah. and you're like did the person who did this for you were they just fucking with you i love seeing that shit with uh kanji tattoos and the tattoo actually says like this person's a fucking idiot yeah and they think it means like tiger spirit or something i'm a tiger mom <laughs> i love how that like entire movement was invented by like an abusive insane person and it's still a term we use what what now the whole tiger mom thing now, Max, is this worth bringing up in our 36th Chamber of Shaolin no, commentary? No, it's not. You're right. Is there a better movie we can bring it up in? Um, 13 going in 30. Okay. We we'll re- save it for then. <laughs> we do that movie eventually. Listeners, hold us to it. If you want to hear our 13 on going on 30 <laughs> commentary track. 13 going on 36th Chamber, Chamber of, of Shaolin. Shaolin. Yeah. That's the movie I want to see. A little 13-year-old girl, old girl gets, like, metempsychosis into the body of Gordon Liu and then has to fight the Tartars. I also oh, really like this one. real yeah, meaning of love. Yeah. This summer. <laughs> I really like this one, too, because it looks like he's just standing in between two massive cigarettes. Like, it's fun to imagine you trying to do this. It looks like a gigantic fucking blunt, like two blunt wraps. <laughs> yes, and if he moves his head, he's going to get burned. My little sister got away with that for the longest time when we were growing up because um, she would smoke weed in her room like an idiot. And my parents would just be like, oh, well, we found like papers and ash and stuff. And he's like, no, I was just burning sage. It's fine. And I'm just, I don't know how she got away with it for as long as she did. Would she actually burn sage to hide the smell, though? Uh, she had sage. I don't know if she burned it nearly as much as she okay. claimed to. Is your sister one of those weirdos that's like, you've got to burn sage every time you move into a new apartment to no. get rid of the bad? My, just... my sister is smarter than I am in okay. every way. I'll talk shit about my family, but shout outs to my little sister. The only cool one in the family. Oh, man, I love this. I love how the uh, Shaw brothers use um, 
you know, reflection and catch lights in their cinema, uh, especially where they're not afraid to get really dramatic with how they show it. And they're, they're really okay with having a lot of like reflection right into the lens. But basically what it does is it really shows you how like, oh, they are going for a blatantly artificial like yeah. aesthetic. And the, the most real thing about their movies are their Kung Fu uh, techniques that they exhibit. Which, by the way, I probably should have mentioned this earlier. I've brought up the phrase hungar several times. When I say hungar, I am referring specifically to a, the type of kung fu. So that's what that is. That's the hungar kung fu is the type of kung fu that's practiced by uh, uh, Lao Kar Lung and was what he sort of made his, his name in when he was a choreographer working on the Wang Fei Hung films that came out in the 50s. There were a bunch of them. Um, and then when he became a director, obviously, that was one of his strengths, was showing the, the Hungar style. The head chamber. This one's That's ridiculous. Why I call my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. This would, I guess if you were making a porn parody, you wouldn't have to change the name of this one at yeah. all. It would be funny. If this is fucking hilarious. Just <laughs> just headbutt these sandbags, you piece of shit. That's the other thing I really love about this movie um, is how it has this really beautiful. It is a really beautiful example of like cultural heritage. Right. Um, but at the same time, it does not sacrifice like silly comedy. There's comedic moments in this that kind of remind me of like Mel Brooks. Like this monk with the fucking like scabbed over head because he's the master of like smashing your head against he's things. He's the master of the head but the sandbag chamber. <laughs> yeah. Not only does he have like prosthetic scabs on his fucking forehead. He has all this wacky arm on a stick. <laughs> yes, that he whacks people with if they don't hit their head hard enough. But even though this is silly, right? Again, it's another thing that would be important if you were actually trying to train in Kung Fu. You got to I don't know a lot about martial arts, but I know if you knock someone off balance, if you got control of their head or whatever, it's probably over for them. So you got to keep a strong neck. Got to have a strong head. So Max, I want to bring up another thing to another way of looking at the kung fu performance and the tradition uh, of the presence of kung fu as a tradition in this movie. And this is from a book called Kung Fu Cult Masters from Bruce Lee to Crouching Tiger by Leon Hunt. And one of the ways he tried to talk about like the authenticity of Kung Fu performance in the Shaw Brothers movies was um, to describe it in several different ways. And one of the ways he describes it is with this concept he created of ar archival authenticity is what he calls it. And um, he refers to it as archival authenticity refers to the authenticity of the actual martial arts featured in Kung Fu films. Chinese martial arts films have showcased with varying degrees of accuracy, a range of real styles uh, and he then goes on to list a number of the styles. But um, the first one he lists is Southern and Northern Shaolin styles and their derivatives. The differences between Northern and Southern Chinese Kung Fu are popular encapsulated in the phrase Northern leg, Southern fist. The North was flat and open, thus the emphasis on high and flying kicks, supposedly to remove opponents from their horses, and wide stances. The South was marshy, more crowded, and in the case of Huan Dong, built up. Thus, the emphasis on solid stances and fighting styles adopted to enclosed spaces. Uh, Lao Kar Lung's films focus particularly on southern animal styles. Snake, crane, tiger, leopard, and dragon. Yep. And uh, he continues on the next page. And the Shaolin-derived Hung Gar, which also deploys the Wu Xing, or five elements fist, wood, metal, water, fire, and earth. Um, Hung Gar is associated with the southern Shaolin rebel Hung He Kwan, who combined the close quarter tiger style t taught to him by the monk Zi Shan with the white crane first practiced by his wife, Fang Wing Chun. Um, yeah, so he goes on to talk about some of the movies that exhibit that. But again, the interesting thing about that, though, we're talking about the Hungar style that was practiced by Lao Kar Lung, right? Remember... He didn't start life as a filmmaker. He started life as an acolyte of Kung Fu. And the most fascinating thing about this movie, Max, is that Lao Kar Lung, if you look at the lineage of his training and you look at his master and his master's master, he was taught by his father, so his father's master, yeah. you can track it back to this fucking character in this movie. Which is crazy. And this temple. 
this southern Shaolin temple in the Fujian pro- province that was, you know, famously burned down um, by the Qing uh, government because, again, they don't want people knowing Kung Fu because <laughs> that's not good for them, right? So they burned down the Shaolin temple in the south. And then, of course, one of the side effects of that historically was, you know, a lot of the survivors of this temple burning uh, would go on to become kind of like folk heroes in the Guangdong area. And they would go around becoming kind of like medicine men and uh, sort of uh, disseminating kung fu practice and techniques to people who are looking to potentially become resistance fighters against the Qing dynasty. I just... It's just endlessly fascinating to me, though, because it's like we are watching the literal forms that were practiced hundreds of years ago when this actually happened. And we're watching, it's like the literal lineage of it. You know, we're watching someone who literally has inherited these things. It'd be great to meet some of these people. Yeah. You know know how like at the, toward the end of the movie, spoilers, they they offer him being in charge of any of the 34 chambers besides the 35th? 30, or yeah, yeah. Um, they <laughs> what kind of person do you think it would be that like I, i'm gonna be in charge of the headbutting chamber <laughs> i want to be that guy and just be like so so what made you want to do this he's like, I'm just like oh, i already had the scabs in my head I might as well stay <laughs> yeah. here maybe that's the only chamber where you get the hand stick maybe he already had the scabs on his head before he went into that chamber he was just born deformed and he's just like oh i fit in finally or it's his way of punishing everyone where he's like, if I have scabs on my head, you everyone else will as well. I just have a really dry scalp. None of this <laughs> has to do with me headbutting stuff. So yes, uh, we haven't mentioned it, but Gordon Liu's character is a man named, he's he's called Santa in this movie, but I think it's spelled Sante. <laughs> I, uh, the spellings are always different depending on which book you look at, but he was... He was a specific monk that, again, in real life was present at that southern Shaolin temple when it was burned. Yeah, Romanizing ma- yeah, Mandarin names is off a lot of time very difficult. Yeah, because you have to wonder what dialect of Mandarin yeah. it was taken from as well. But even that's just that's just Mandarin. The yeah. thing about the southern areas of China, too, is like Cantonese is its own language. And like... That's why when you're researching these movies, like I mentioned with Lao Kar Lung with his Mandarin name, Lao Kar Lung is Cantonese. So that's its that's basically its own separate language. Yeah. You know, like so you have all these other weird elements that make um the the, the sort of the uh translation of different names kind of complicated. But I also think it kind of contributes to the mythopoeic quality of th- this storytelling. You know, where it's like these people go by different names, but you can generally recognize it and it sort of builds different images of them to different communities. Um, and it just sort of adds to their mythic character. We haven't really talked a lot about um, Gordon Liu specifically, but I think one thing to really mention about his performance in this movie and part of what makes it so great is he's not just a great performer of the martial arts, but he's very talented at emoting um, when doing it. Like he's great at, he doesn't have a wide rate of range of emotions that he performs, but he's very talented at making intense focus on whatever object he's, he's focused on very engaging and interesting. He has this wonderful, like thousand yard stare, which again, to compare him to Legolas, and Orlando Bloom doesn't make him an object of ridicule, but really makes him look um, like he's absorbing everything around him. You know, he's th- these very strong features and these big eyes. I don't know. I just think it's an interesting performance. And it's the type of performance style that, again, is never going to be talked about as much because people are going to focus mostly on the kung fu and overlook its relationship to acting, which, as we've already established, part of being... Historically, traditionally, part of Kung Fu is also part of acting because of its need to be covert and hidden and yet performed for people.
One other thing to mention about this movie's strengths, uh, and we talked about sort of its structure with these different um, chambers being the sort of main centerpiece attraction of the movie. And certainly all these all these chambers are very exciting. These like Kung Fu movies are a great example of the legacy of the cinema of attractions that we always bring up. Right. Whereas if you saw this at a carnival, you would not be surprised to see someone pulling off these really impressive feats at a carnival, but also would be incredibly entertaining without the actual cinematic apparatus as well. Um, so these spectacles of the training are obviously very engaging and very fun to watch. However, another really interesting thing about how Gordon Liu goes through these chambers and the escalating um, sort of tension that builds as he gets better and better is how kind of hectic and crazy the editing is in this movie. It's kind of easy to overlook, but a lot of the cuts are really kind of crazy and kinetic, you know? Yeah, which, I mean, goes along with the fast striking style of this. But I think it really goes far in building up the momentum of him training. And I think it's why this middle sequence of the movie, the second act, which lasts probably about an hour. The majority of the movie. Yeah, where he's in the going up through the 36 chambers training, mastering his skills. It's why I feel it, I feel like it's surprisingly short. Every time I watch this movie, I'm like, oh man, this middle section is going to feel longer and longer. But yeah. it never does. And we're at the end of it now. Did we just finish? Yeah. You, you just said you finished. Isn't the, that so fucking weird? I know. You always expect there to be like 10 more <laughs> chambers. And you're like, oh, fuck. So again, I think it's another one of those things where, um, you know, Lau Karlong, don't disrespect his virtuosity as a filmmaker in addition to his virtuosity as a choreographer. Um, because he is quite talented at knowing what to do with the camera. And he does have some very interesting stylistic touches that are distinctly different from other Shaw Brothers directors, like most notably uh, Chang Che, who was uh, the other big director there. Um, Lau Karlung, very interesting in when he decides to go wide with his compositions. Also very interesting in when he decides to use zooms, I think. He's very... I th He has this very peculiar style of like using zooms to then reframe shots and immediately go into like a very kinetic edit where action is occurring immediately afterward. There's definitely a quality to the filmmaking decisions that is not present in other Shaw Brothers films as well. Uh, also, uh, I would say a more restrained and interesting usage of slow motion compared to Chang Che. I guess we're not completely done. We're done with the chambers. We're done with the chambers. We're not done with his character arc of mastery. And this is really, again, going back to that, like, I want to argue vaguely materialist, vaguely Marxist um, element of the resistance of the Kung Fu ethic here, right? Um, this is what prevents this movie from being, like, purely, like, a conservative Western that is involved in like nas nationalist myth making, but it's not a Western. It's an Eastern by definition. <laughs> Very funny. No, I'm, I, I, I mean, yes, that's a bad pun, but also like it's sensibilities. And it's like, even if you could interpret this as a very individualistic movie, it's like you would never mistake it for having the same beats as a Western or something like that. It's not that kind of individualist story. no, and you're talking about the idea of the individualism that's going to come to the forefront here because this is this training sequence against this confrontational monk that he sort of bumps shoulders with throughout his entire time at uh, the Shaolin temple. This other monk who is always saying like, you're ambitious, you know, you're using Kung Fu so you can explicitly change politics in the real world that goes against the tenets of our temple. Right. It is this very necessary, interesting confrontation that has to happen in addition to him mastering the other chambers, right? It's not enough for him to simply become uh, a master of the technique, but in order to truly embody the Kung Fu ethic, he must reinvent the technique to meet, the again, the political ends, the pragma pragmatic ends that are in front of him. Um and of course, in order to do that, he has to sort of pass this gauntlet that is represented by this more conservative, more restrained and detached uh, monk, who, again, we emphasize, is better than him when they first start fighting. Yeah. He cannot beat this monk right away. Despite being the Mary Sueist of Mary Sue. 
going through every single chamber faster than anybody has ever done it in history. Which still, five years. Yeah. Another interesting thing we haven't commented upon. Um, the, oh, my God. Speaking of Wu-Tang, this is going to be a little side tangent for me, but um, in the last uh, Tekken game, there was this character. <laughs> okay. Who uh, He was clearly inspired by the Wu-Tang clan. <laughs> okay, that's funny. Um, but he he's like this elderly black man who, like, practices like Ji Kwon Do and Wushu styles. Um, and his backstory is he left when New York was like a shithole in the seventies. Okay. Cause his family was killed by gangs. And then he studied in China for 40 years learning these styles. And I just love the idea of like somebody leaving New York in the seventies and like going off on a mission to train in China, to take back the streets and then coming back and just seeing it's a gentrified fucking they're fighting Instagram influencers. Yeah. <laughs> and like tender queers. <laughs> that That's all that's left there now. Sorry, man. Oh, I would love to see Gordon Liu fight like uh, fucking Wall Street bankers. But like a tender queer Pete Buttigieg psychopath. <laughs> Just like, I'm overwhelmed. I can't deal with you. And then they run away. It would be funny. The day that Boudiage refers to himself as queer is the day that stops being a progressive term. <laughs> yes. Well, Max, to get back to what we're talking about, though. I'm sorry. That was just a little tangent. No, it's fine. little digression. Um, one of the things that's really exciting and interesting about, you know, the way Kung Fu is presented, and again, I think something that is would explain part of its transnational appeal and its appeal to people like the members of Wu-Tang Clan in recognizing the sort of pol acts of political resistance in this movie is how open-ended Kung Fu is. You know, the thing that prevents it, like we were saying, from being like this conservative myth-making that reinforces a type of nationalist ideology is that it critiques it inherently. In this movie, we see like the Kung Fu temple, the Shaolin temple, they are not uh, the, uh, they're not the final word on the morality that's present in this movie. And furthermore, once Gordon Liu has mastered their techniques, once he's learned the Kung Fu, which is the ultimate sort of value and resource that the Shaolin Temple has, he is still able to improve upon it further than they have. Kung Fu is not this closed off thing that is a dead end. It's not a cul-de-sac. It is always open-ended. And also it is always something that can be adapted from, you know, accidental occurrences uh, observations in nature, like this, um, this sort of like, I don't even know what to call this device he invented, like this three part a multi chain pole. Yeah, multi part bow staff. Yeah, which he invented to fight this monk with his dual uh, butterfly blades. Um, it's something that he stumbled upon accidentally, almost like a haiku. Yeah. You know, where haikus are just. You know, traditionally, people would go out into nature and they would compose them based on literally what they saw in front of them. Um, it, it, this construction of this weapon is the same thing, you know? And that's what I'm saying, where it has this direct connection to, like, the materialism of the people involved. And that is the heart of the Kung Fu ethic. It's not good at being... It, it's not about being good at martial arts or being, you know, the master killer... <laughs> which was the title of this movie when it was exported to the U.S. and a member of the Wu-Tang Clan, of course. Do you have a favorite member of the Wu-Tang Clan? <laughs> I don't know. Not old dirty bastard? <laughs> I mean, if you're asking me, like, aesthetically what the favorite name is, old dirty bastard is pretty good. Um, I don't know. There was this one thing. It was like an it wasn't MTV Cribs, but it was like something like that where they're like when the Wu-Tang Clan all lived together in this gigantic mansion when they were collaborating <laughs> And they're like, oh, yeah, and that's old Dirty's couch. Like, all of them had these extravagant bedrooms, and old Dirty Bastard <laughs> just lived on a fucking couch. Contributing to his legend of yeah. being an old Dirty Bastard. Um, but what was I saying? I forget. What was I talking about? Oh, I was talking about the connection to the materialism, right? So it's like everything that they innovate with the Kung Fu, it's, it, they, they necessarily must come into conflict with the temple at least a little bit in order to, to drive its motivation. And again, it's going to be reinforced here where he's actually going to get kicked out of the temple. Kicked out in 18 quotation marks. In quotation marks. Yeah. But the idea is that 
you know, it's this necessary thing where he's going to come in to conflict with the uh, temple in order to reinvent it. And that's a necessary part of the life cycle of Kung Fu. And because this movie is sort of about the generational handing down of Kung Fu in, in this sense between the movie itself and its audience, it is about this continual need for rejuvenation and regeneration of the Kung Fu style, which is again, why it's not about martial arts specifically, but it's about the specific ethic in this movie, at least of resistance more importantly than the Kung Fu itself than the martial arts itself. Um, I'm going to go back to talking about a section from uh, this book, Kung Fu Cult Masters by Leon Hunt, where they're talking about the sort of 36 chamber uh, is the most famous of these movies that are part of the Shaolin temple cycle. But there, this was a cycle within the Shaw brother yes. movies. I know this movie had two direct sequels from what I understand. Two direct sequels. And there were a number of not prequels, but other movies with Shaolin in the title that had yeah. to do with the Shaolin temple. Um, and they all have their own specific specificities that are even more specific than just Shaw Brothers Kung Fu movies. Um, but Leon Hunt writes, the Kung Fu film has an ongoing interest in the process of learning, the transmission and embodiment of knowledge, the relationship between masters and their disciples. Um, then later on, one of the things he talks about as one of the key elements of the Kung Fu Shaolin movie is the relationship between the master and the the pupil, and he calls the master the Shifu. He writes that a relationship founded on discipline and subservience. Uh, Tony Raines, another critic, characterizes the master pupil Gestalt as impersonal sadomasochistic units devoid of all sexual connotations with both teacher and student driven by spiritual will. Roger Garcia describes the process as training slash learning slash birth process framed in pain, but also a form of hereditary practice whereby the pupil is molded into a facsimile of the master in order to, for history to survive. Given the operatic background of many Kung Fu stars, Jing Ju is an obvious ref- referent here. Jing Ju referring to a specific type of opera style that sort of crosses over with Kung Fu theatricality, like we mentioned earlier. Um, Joe Riley, another critic, explains that another word for master is Lao Shu. Shu meaning to imitate. In Chinese opera, the master's body is the teaching text reproduced in the student by imitation that performers embody not only themselves alone, but also the chain of history that produced them. Right? So embodying the master, you are embodying the master's master ad infinitum. Yeah. You, are, you are keeping the, the flame lit. You're keeping the culture alive. Um, but of course, this movie espouses a slightly different version of that where it's saying... It's not enough to be a perfect facsimile of the master because in order to have an actual political relevance, you cannot be. You must constantly be adapting and you must constantly be evolving your Kung Fu technique and your martial arts from the material conditions around you. And that's why I think this movie so authentically speaks to an experience of resistance, even in this very like cheesy 70s Kung Fu fantasy way. You know, because it's about going back to your real life and looking at what's in front of you and looking at how that produces a subjectivity of resistance and a, a desire for change and liberation and the unification of a more um, healthy and proper community. And here we have this, this scene, Max. When, the first time you watched this, what did you think of this? Because this is one of the most dramatic moments because he's finally out of the temple after five years and he's going back to fight Wilson Tong again and he's finally there to get revenge. How did you think this played? I, it, it was interesting. I, I kind of thought like he does carry himself more like a monk now, but like I kind of thought his lessons in Buddhism would just be like, oh, well, like, if I were the man I were five years ago, I'd be here for revenge. But no, he's just sort of like, no, I won't kill you, but I'll let another guy kill you. And I know Kung Fu now. Isn't that fucking sweet? It's a great confrontation and very snappy and well choreographed, but it, it's as different beats than I would expect it to from a contemporary movie. Which I isn't, agree. Isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I think it adds to, again, the focus of this movie in um, the sort of politicization of him as an individual um, and I think it, again, is speaking to that ambiguity where it's like, if this was a more typical, oh, here we have the moment where the payoff with the wrist technique, right? Where he bends the pole because he has the strong wrist. Yeah. 
And then he's able to notice the throwing knives because he trained his eyes and he sees the reflection with the catch lights. It's so good. Yes. It's so good. I love, I love Lau Kar Lung's directorial style. He's so good at like complimenting his, his Kung Fu choreography, like perfectly. He knows exactly when to cut, uh, in order to emphasize like different body parts moving. It's just so good. Here he is. He's using the thing with the bell, right? Yeah. He's hitting him with the spear. It's ah, it's so perfect, Max. If only he had to headbutt something. <laughs> he will soon when he has to recruit someone who wants to test him. He had he headbutts like a like a pile of bamboo or whatever, and splinters it into a thousand pieces. But Max, part of you, what you're talking about with these beats being a little bit different, I think speaks again to the need for something greater than um, than personal revenge, and it's part of what prevents this movie from being. Again, a very like basic revenge movie that more singularly embraces the like capitalist ideology of the individual conquering the recon- the the antagonisms of the system, right? Um, he's conquered. He's got an individual revenge. This is a little bit funny. This guy wailing on this on Wilson Tong here, hacking him to bits. So he's got personal revenge on these guys, but the movie's not over. And we still have about 20 minutes left. That's because this is not the final goal and this is not the climactic confrontation. The climactic part of this movie, Max, is the training that he must now perform for other people. And uh, this process, Max, kind of reminds me, this might be a weird comparison, but this this kind of reminds me of uh, one of my favorite scenes from the original Godfather, which I can't, I don't know when the last time you saw that movie was. Um, but do you remember years ago? Do you yeah. remember the hospital scene where Al Pacino has to save Don Corleone? Yeah. That's one of my favorite scenes from the movie because when Al Pacino walks in, he just wants to save his dad, you know, and it's a very individual emotion. It, it's something we all can relate to for the most part, right? Is this impulse to look out for your family or whoever you consider family and try to save them. But then as he's saving his dad, there's this clear thing where it's like there's this transformation that happens where it's like his impulse to save his dad has become a political act, you know, and it has implications for everyone around him that he's doing this. And it's the same thing with this movie where Gordon Liu, he has this very human, very basic impulse to get revenge on these people that ruined his life and killed his family and his friends. But as he's following that impulse, it becomes a politicized act and the nature of his desire changes. This also relates to something that I brought up way at the beginning of this commentary track by comparing this to uh, Sherlock Jr. And uh, one of the things we talked about in that movie is this sort of dichotomy between um, narrative and spectacle, the spectacle of the performance and the stunts and everything, where this sort of vaudevillian element would often form like digressions from the narrative, right? If you think about it, his journey to the 36th chamber in this movie, Gordon Liu's, is kind of like one massive digression from the narrative. And what is that narrative? It's a basic revenge narrative. Of course, this digression doesn't just depart from that basic revenge narrative, it actually transforms it. Where once he comes back, he'll get revenge, the narrative will be completed, but we will have gained something from that middle part of the movie where it is not merely enough to get revenge. We must build the 36th chamber. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about like, this movie, perhaps more than any other Shaw Brothers movie, embodying the um, the process of disseminating Kung Fu uh, historically, but also the political implications of it. It's not about revenge. It's about the community you build. You might have started your journey because of revenge, but uh, if that's where you end it, you're not actually going to achieve anything. And a lot of these characters that he starts to recruit in this third part of the movie, Max, actually become these like stock folklore hero names of other Kung Fu masters that would escape the burning of the Shaolin Temple in the Fujian province. And many of these other characters are people that, you know, other Shaw Brothers movies are about. And again, if you I like him ineffectually trying to blow on the fire, (laughs) 
I mean, this is comedic Max, but this is just another example of the materialism of that specific um, resistance coming into play, right? Where he, how does he fight against them? He uses his blacksmith's hammer. And if you look at him as a blacksmith, his labor is also, if you want to look at this as anti-capitalist, anti-exploitation filmmaking, his labor is significant to the, the Qing military, right? Because he has to produce the weaponry for them. So not only is he depriving of that, them of that, he's going to use that, those skills against them. And furthermore, he's going to develop his own martial arts skill from the exploitative practices that he was subjected to. You know what else uh, Gordon Liu's performance in this part of the movie reminds me of, except I like his performance way more, is uh, <laughs> he reminds me of uh, Charlton Heston from The Ten Commandments, where I really like the first half of that movie. And then Charlton Heston goes out into the desert and he gets a beard and he becomes so fucking boring. His Moses, once he's enlightened, is so goddamn uninteresting. <laughs> Um, but honestly, Max, it is kind of a similar character arc, isn't it? Moses goes into the desert, becomes enlightened, comes back with a beard and the Ten Commandments, starts leading a group of people to their promised land, right? Teaching them the ways of God. It's vaguely similar, right? We're still doing this. Ah, uh, yes, this guy, Lua Kai, is also one of the big folkloric heroes, right? So this guy right here is going to be someone that the Shaw brothers would make other movies about. Um, but also, <laughs> bringing up Moses, it's kind of funny timing, because something that the uh, blacksmith refers to him as, and the blacksmith here is also a, a folkloric hero that I can't remember the name of, but the bla blacksmith refers to him as the Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva. Jesus Christ. The bot body sattva. The body sattva, Max. Say it with me. Body sattva. Body sattva. Yes, that's what it is. <laughs> the body sattva is a figure in Buddhism who is someone who is able to reach nirvana, but delays doing so out of compassion in order to help other people. And that's what Gordon Liu is referred to as. And it is interesting to compare him to Moses in that regard, isn't it? That he's gotten so good at Kung Fu that these people could consider him a Bodhisattva. Yeah. Also, Max, it reminds me of another movie we've done in the show, La Belle at La Bette and Jean Cocteau's filmmaking practice. Okay. We talked a lot about how um, Jean Cocteau tried to incorporate biographical elements into his filmmaking as a way of achieving what he referred to as poetry. And I think he would consider these Kung Fu films as poetry as well. Why? Because he would probably relate the biographical element of his own filmmaking to the historical and cultural authenticity that is represented by the real Kung Fu forms. He would see these things being performed in front of the camera and say, that's a real Kung Fu form that's generations old, right? And it's surviving on film and you're achieving poetry by performing this true authentic act in front of the camera. And uh, one of the things that Jean Cocteau often relates to that genuine poetic act in front of the camera is this sense of apotheosis and a type of transcendence of death. And again, it's sort of what they're talking about here with the bodhisattva, where it's like, it's not necessarily the same thing, but it is reaching a type of enlightenment through the work that you're performing. Another way to talk about this is by referencing uh, Walter Benjamin's idea of the aura. Um, and there's another really essay that I won't quote from at length, but there's another really es great essay on this movie called uh, Lao Kar Lung with Walter Benjamin, Storytelling, Authenticity, F Film Performance, and Martial Arts Pedagogy by Luke White, where he talks about you know the performance of this 
The performances in this movie in reference to Walter Benjamin's idea of aura, and then he introduces a concept that I was unfamiliar with from Benjamin called the Erfarong, which is another type of experience. Um, but Luke White writes that um, Benjamin begins his account of aura by describing it in terms of the physical, unique presence in time and space of objects. Such unique presence is the prerequisite to the concept of authenticity and is what is lost in the reproduced image. Uh, however, Benjamin goes on to discuss the erratic as involving not only physical presence, but also indexical connection to an entire historical context. What is at play in the erratic object is all that is transmissible from its beginning, ranging from its substantive duration to its testimony to the history which it has experienced. Again, if we think about that in reference to the karate, or not karate, the kung fu in this movie, uh, the martial arts, they are always bearing testimony not only to the performer's own training, but to the history of the moves that they have inherited from their own masters when they started learning, right? So the you can make a strong argument that these uh, kung fu forms are a very strong embodiment of Walter Benjamin's idea of aura. But basically... Um, Luke White in this essay goes on to connect these ideas to th this thing called the air for wrong, which is another specific type of experience that uh, Benny Mean would elaborate on. And I don't know if it's quite the same as stuff we've talked about with like Jean Cocteau or whatever, but it is this idea of like slowly layered experience that is built into a human being that can only be accumulated through time and effort and then existentially declares itself as such whenever you see it. So if you see someone perform Kung Fu in a movie, you know that they they can't fake that. You know you yeah. can only achieve that by, by training. And that's why it has a certain effect when you see it. And that's why there's a difference between seeing stuff like for real and seeing CGI. Because you see someone for real doing it, and you're like, I'm my mind is recognizing what Benjamin would call the air farang that type of experience that is slowly built and layered. And there's no replacement for it. You can't substitute it for something fake and have it have the same impact. And I just think that's a very interesting way to look at how this movie sort of demonstrates its action, you know? I could give up my life on the vague promise of being a Shaolin monk. Now, what was the requirement he had to have in order to get back in the temple? He had to get a bunch of signatures from townsfolk or whatever. It was different. I, I didn't notice that because it was different in the translation. Oh, do watched. you remember? In the one I watched, it was uh, go live as a beggar and do not come back until oh, you what are the called. Fuck? That's yeah. very different. In this one, it says he has to get like, he has to get like, it's almost like he has to go out and get like uh, notices from his like fucking uh, constituents or whatever. With Kung Fu. Now, Max, I meant to ask you, did you have a favorite chamber? Oh, the head chamber. The head chamber? Yes. But just because of the silliness? It's not even just the silliness. It's just... Uh, I don't know. I, I It was the contrast of the silliness with like the ending zen of putting in a thing of incense and just sort of walking around. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're not only going to like hit our heads until we're like concussed as fuck and can barely walk. We're going to... We have to pray at the end of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Buddha, for our daily bread so I can hit my fucking forehead again. <laughs> you know, I can make a joke about them with, like, doing, like, Catholic prayers, but, like, there is something weirdly Catholic about this movie, too, <laughs> where, like, so much of the training is, like, about like punishment to the body that I associate with Catholicism specifically, you know, it's a little bit funny. I don't know. I don't know. Buddhism and yeah, 
Christianity are similar in the aspects that they are shoot offs of what were previously much bigger religions and then all that supplanted them. What was the shoot off for Buddhism? Oh, Hinduism. It, uh, it is interesting when you think about it too, because Buddhism, I'm not an expert as uh, I'm sure listeners will know, but it does seem inherently transnational in some ways as well. Right. You know, yeah, like it seems to spring up across multiple countries at once and in different ways. Like there's Japanese traditions of Buddhism that are, I'm sure, are different. From well, it like, traveled down the Silk Road. Yeah, so it it deposits itself all across like Asia. The more eastward you get, apparently, the more fun the temples get. <laughs> Is that true? Yes. Um, it's like Shaolin Kung Fu and whatnot, like. That's so far removed from the original Buddhist teaching. <laughs> yes. Oh, man, this action scene is so good. Like, it goes without saying, um, for every, for every uh, action scene in this movie that it's really amazing. But I just think it's like... Gordon Liu's movement is so incredible. It's not just about how good he is at performing different, like, um, attacking motions, but it's how nimble and how great he is at evading attacks, where you see a lot of his kung fu mastery. Gordon Liu is incredible at, like, dodging things. You see a little bit of, of it when he's, like, fighting Liu Akai with the bamboo rods, um, and he's, like, constantly, like, jamming his foot down on the bamboo so that he can't be hit with it. And it's just like, God damn, he's so nimble and he's so exciting to watch. Have you seen many other Gordon Liu um, featured movies from the Shaw Brothers, Max? Uh, the, the Shaw Brothers movies that I've seen were so long ago that I wouldn't be able to remember any distinct actors. But. There's so many good ones. Um, I, I can definitely see where people, if they if they watch one and they get a little bit tired of it, they might feel like they're a little bit samey. Um, because a lot of them feel somewhat redundant, but the, I mean, the, the action scenes are always incredible. Number one. Um, but number two, uh, some of them truly do st like really stand out. Um, as far as people watching this who are fans of Gordon Liu, uh, there are a few other ones I would recommend off the top of my head. Another one directed by Lau Kar Lung that I really like is called eight diagram pole fighter. That's one of the later ones he made. And I think it's, I believe it's about the guy who founded the Shaolin Temple, actually. And again, it's something kind of like this movie where he develops a new Shaolin Kung Fu technology, where he develops this, he's the eight diagram pole fighter, right? So yep. he, he develops this pole fighting stuff. Um, much like how Gordon Liu develops the weird, like, I, I don't know, the three part stick or whatever he uses. <laughs> but maybe my favorite Gordon Liu movie uh, is... Dirty Ho, which comes out a year following this one, where Gordon Liu is a, a prince from a Chinese court, and he's on the run because his siblings want to assassinate him so he can they can, you know... Uh, Assume the throne or whatever. Yeah, compartmentalize yeah. power. And he's, like, hiding as someone who just likes booze and antiques, and he's got a dope mustache. But that one is amazing because a lot of the kung fu choreography is him trying to hide the fact that he's performing kung fu. So it's him doing like subtle things to act like an idiot, but he's actually like bumping into people and like punching them across the room. It's his performance in that is really great. I love how like this big action set piece is just like flower. Such a strange little thing. Again, I think it relates to again, working stuff, working yeah. conditions. A lot of the stuff they use to liberate themselves is related to like everyday activities and manual labor. And again, there's different ways you can approach it. You can look at it as something that's reinforcing a capitalist work ethic or something that's speaking to like material conditions uh, that will provide the key to your liberation even as you're being exploited. <coughs> and here we have the final confrontation with Lo Lei. For my limited time doing Shaolin, those were the kinds of swords that you had the opportunity to learn how to use. Either those are iron fans, depending on what you wanted to learn. Is there any, I know it was a long time ago, but is there anything from your experience practicing Kung Fu? Well, because a lot you, of, it gives you a different view of this. Um, well, it wasn't Kung Fu, it was Shaolin Kempo, which is a mixture of okay. traditional Shaolin and American martial arts. 
Um, I mean, like, it's interesting for me just sort of, like, recognizing random strikes or katas or combinations, in, like, interspliced into this and seeing, like, oh, that, that has roots way, way back. Especially certain strikes pop out, but, like, no, I'm not going to be like, oh, yes, I have a deeper understanding of this. Like, I appreciate it and just, like, how fucking ridiculous that and hard this is. But also, it it's it's been quite a while at yeah. this point. You know, watching this movie makes me really wish I had an understanding of the different forms. Because the way you describe it, it's almost like it's almost like watching a movie in its original language. Yes. You know, the kung fu performances become their own language and you can see how the, every kung fu performance is kind of like its own dialogue and they interact with one another, you know? And I have to imagine if you really know just a lot of the forms and their histories and lineages, you're going to find a lot of really interesting subtleties in the way that these characters fight with one another. Like if you, if you know about Kung Fu and you're really knowledgeable about it and yet have somehow <coughs> never seen these movies, I feel like this is going to be such a delightful experience to watch these. Although we're, ta- we're t- talking through our big end Darth Vader fight. Yeah. And it's about to end, Bax. He's about to win. Yeah. What do you think about the way that this fight ends? Well, I like the visual callback to when the bamboo first fell on him and he got the idea for the staff. I really do like that. Yeah. Uh, it, it was like the scene in the graveyard earlier where you saw all of his techniques finally paying off perfectly. But it shows his contribution to Shaolin was the thing that re- he really needed all along. Yeah. And the fact that he could not have... It's this interesting thing where his goal has become bigger than the personal revenge, but he also could not have achieved the personal revenge without av- without adjusting his goal. Yes. Headbutt for the win. <coughs> See, that's why that's the most important chamber. Now, the way the fight ends is fascinating to me, Max, because you don't actually see him defeat the guy finally. You just see him headbutt him and then best him. And in some ways, the actual literal defeat is superfluous because at that point in the fight, we've seen enough. It's like, yeah, Gordon Liu is better than this guy. He won. He beat. Th- we don't have to see him literally kill this guy in order to understand that. We know he's better and he's succeeded. He's now surpassed this guy. And again, it speaks to the, the change in Gordon Liu's goals at the beginning of the movie. If we stayed with the character that is Gordon Liu at the beginning of the movie, we would have needed to see him defeated and dead. But we don't have to at the end because... He's reached this new level of enlightenment through his pursuit of the Kung Fu ethic, and it's not the most important thing anymore. It kind of reminds me of that famous combat scene in uh, kind of a random connection. The classic what a way to end the movie. The classic <laughs> Archer movie, uh, The Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, where he fights Anton Walbrook. Uh, Roger Livesey fights him, and uh, they don't actually see the fight because it's not important. Uh, Martin Scorsese says he talks about it all the time, but the ending of that fight, not important because something bigger no. and better is in our goal. He's and transcended it, that fight. Yeah. What is the ending? It's the school. It's the teaching. He has become the master. He's become the, the master of the 36th chamber of Shaolin. And we end with this really silly joke where he like fucks with a student. <laughs> this the movie, same way his teachers fucked with him though. Yeah. This movie has such a great sense of fun despite, you know what it's about and everything. A murder revenge story. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. This movie is just such a special movie. It puts a smile on your face. Yeah. We've barely scratched the surface of all the historical implications of the different Kung Fu forms and how they, how they relate to the Kung Fu genre. But I think the thing I would hope that everyone who's listens to this walks away with it from is this idea that like these movies are incredibly rich in terms of like the cultural history they represent and hold within them. And, um, you know, a lot of the best Shaw Brothers movies, you really feel like as a viewer, you're participating in the tradition. You're not just a bystander sitting on the outside. They're they're built in, as spectacles and designed in a way to bring you into this reverence for the Kung Fu tradition and these people who practiced it. And um, I don't know. It's a very special viewing experience. These movies are amazing. I would love for the opportunity to see this movie on the big screen one day. Same. Um, and if you want to see some other movies we'd love to see on the big screen someday you can check us out at the spectator film podcast.com we are also available on apple podcasts itunes spotify stitcher um 
you can pirate us on the Pirate Bay, I'm sure. Um, sure. Uh, you also, please check out our YouTube channel, Spectator Film Podcast on YouTube. Uh, we Max s- is going to do a foot reveal. Yes, um, only when we really, yeah, reach 100 subscribers, though. So <laughs> make sure to get on that. One day soon, we're going to blow up. And we'll-